also with us and listening to this conference. Uh, Istanbul Commerce University is hosting a well-known professor in the fields of communication, media and journalism in the fifth science and society meetings today. Professor Dr. John V. Public will give a talk on the conference titled From Augmented Reality to Virtual Reality, How Experiential Media Are Transforming Journalism. He is a professor of journalism and media studies in School of Communication and Information in Rogers, the State University of New Jersey. Professor Dr. Public has a, a bachelor degree in journalism and public relations from University of Wisconsin Medicine. He has master and PhD degrees in mass communications from University of Minnesota. He studies and writes about the impact of technology on journalism, media, and society. He is the author of several books, journal articles, and book chapters on journalism. He recently completed a two-year project funded by UNESCO on curriculum reform in journalism and mass communication in Iraqi higher education. He is a co-developer of the situated documentary, a form of location-based storytelling using the emerging mobile and variable technology known as augmented reality. He is a former columnist for CNN.com and an executive producer for Fatom.com. He is a member of the advisory board of the Global Communication Research Institute at Shanghai Jiatong University, China. From 1995 to 2002, he was a professor and executive director of the Center of New Media in Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. From 1988 to 1994, he was Associate Director for Research and Technology Studies at the Freedom Forum Media Studies Center at Columbia University. He is a faculty affiliate of the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation. His book, Masterful Stories, Lessons from Golden Age Ratio is forthcoming from Routledge Press. He is a lead principal investigator for a three-year grant from Qatar National Research Fund. Uh, awarded May, two, uh, May 2014, Content Innovation Strategies for Mobile Media in Qatar. I would like to invite Professor Dr. Jelalettin Aktaş, who is the Dean of Faculty of Communication, to make the introduction speech. Welcome, Professor Aktaş. Uh, thank you, Tuba Hocam. Uh, dear public and dear participants, uh, first of all, hello, everyone, and I wish you healthy days in these hard days. In the fifth of the Science and Society meetings, I would like to state that we are honored to have Mr. Pavlik at Istanbul Commerce University. Today, Dr. Pavlik shall share his opinion about how experimental media are transforming journalism. I personally believe that nowadays that digitalism becomes widespread in all areas. It's important to discuss the topic of how experimental media are transforming journalism in this conference. I also believe that uh, our students will find most of the answers to their questions in their minds regarding the, the, the future of journalism and what they are going to do after graduating from the journalism departments. Without making my speech any longer, I would like to leave my place that, to Dr. Pavlik. I would like to one more time uh, to thank Dr. Pavlik for being with us and sharing his opinions. Thank you to Bojan. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Professor uh, Akdash. Hi, Professor Pavlik, how are you? Hello, Dr. Pavlik. Well, thank you. I hope everyone there is, is staying healthy and, and doing well. Yeah, you can start your speech. Thank you very much for uh, uh, accepting. It's a great pleasure. And I am so grateful to you to invite me. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I hope that sometime in the future, it can be in person. And I should mention, I have a new book out. It's called Journalism in the Age of Virtual Reality. And it's just been published by Columbia University Press. And much of my talk today is based on uh, the work from that book. So that's sort of you know uh, where this is, this is coming from. So thank you so much. So let me start with a little outline of my remarks. First, let me describe kind of about experiential media. Uh, experiential media enable us to engage the virtual. I'm going to talk about how experiential media are transforming storytelling in you know media and media environment journalism. How what are the platforms and what forms of content are experiential media uh, taking now? I'll talk about a little bit of the development of experiential media because although they seem very new, uh, they've been in development for for more than a more than a century. 
I'll talk about the global nature of experiential media, and then I'll offer some concluding reflections, some, some questions and, and you know, uh, some thoughts about what are the effects uh, that we may see. So in terms of what about experiential media, I would suggest there are six main dimensions. The first dimension is that experiential media are interactive and that can take a couple of different forms and I'll, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Second, the experiential are immersive. So they, they envelop us and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Uh, they're multi-sensory. So, you know, they're not just sight and sound but also haptics, you know, the tactile interfaces is develop developing. Uh, fourth, they're driven by data and algorithms or even artificial intelligence, we might say. Increasingly, they are giving us the opportunity to have a first person perspective. So traditionally, journalism and media use a third person per point of view, uh, you know, kind of from the outside looking in. First person is as if it's your perspective, you know, from the user's point of view. And then finally, increasingly, these experiential media are designed using a natural user interface. So you know, you just look at things or you talk to it or you, you know, you touch uh, an, uh, the screen or an object. So what do they include? Uh, first, as I've suggested, augmented reality, which is digital content layered on to the user's real world experience in, you know, virtually real time, uh, usually via a mobile or a wearable device. Second is virtual reality. So VR supplants the user's direct world, real world experience with a computer mediated uh, one, usually through a headset, but it could be a volumetric display. So something that might be more of a room based experience, although most of that is limited to kind of small scale holography or some experimental platforms, but there can be more of that in the future. But also beyond that, some of the ultra high definition video platforms that are you know, 8K, ultra high def, very high frame rate, they are so big that they can envelop the user with not just visual, but uh, sort of uh, a spatial audio. So increasingly those systems have qualities of experiential media. And then there are the so-called smart speakers, uh, you know, things like the Echo with Alexa or the Google Home or even some of the handheld platforms uh, allow the user to have a voice experience that can be interactive and can almost pass what's, you know, some people call the Turing test, you know, named after the computer scientist Alan Turing, who proposed that if a human can't tell if they're talking to a machine or a person, then that you know, has passed the test of artificial intelligence. And there's a, a coming together or a confluence of experiential media and journalism. We saw this early on in a platform that was called the Oculus Rift. It was a wearable platform for immersive games, for news stories, and for cinematic uh, virtual reality. And its founder was a person named Palmer Lucky. He was a journalism major in college. And he left in 2012 and proposed a project on one of these online crowdfunding sites called Kickstarter. And he quickly raised $2 million for his project on creating a VR headset. And then two years later, Facebook in 2014 bought his Oculus uh, system for $2.5 billion. So he went 2011, he's a college student. 2012, he raises $2 million on Kickstarter. And by, and by 2014, he's a billionaire. I mean, that's... That's a pretty fast <laughs> trajectory. And he interned with the pioneering immersive journalist, a woman named Noni de la Pena. She's been called the godmother of virtual reality. And she says that VR can be an empathy machine. Uh, it can make each of us uh, a virtual eyewitness to events that are in the news. And you know, so he's, she's done projects about taking you onto the street to learn what it's like to be homeless in Los Angeles. So she's done things like that, that allow you to see things from the point of view of, of someone who might be you know, uh, in a bad situation or in journalism in general. So the interactivity, it can really, this is the first main dimension and it's got two different forms. The first is the interaction between the uh, person, the user, and other, other members of the public or journalists or other, other media storytellers. And we see this, like Snapchat, Oculus, 
the new platform and, and in that platform when you're in VR you can be in there with other people at the same time or you can share your experience so it has uh, a lot of internet a lot of interesting capabilities that way and then there's interaction between the user and the content itself and we'll talk about that and show some examples so here's an example that I made uh, this was a couple of years ago but it, it illustrates augmented reality using a Snapchat filter. So I'm sitting on my back porch, but I don't really have those sunglasses on and, and the flags aren't there and the surfboard isn't there. So I'm using this system to sort of create a, uh, uh, a synthetic representation of me being on the Jersey shore where people like to go in the summer and uh, can play a Well, you can see some other augmented reality as well. And then so in addition to, uh, you know, that kind of AR, we can interact with the content. And usually this can take the form of clicking on content that's embedded within a screen or using AI, AI features to engage with content by talking to some, you know, some sort of a digital device or by looking at it. And an early example was developed after the terrible earthquake in Haiti. About 10 years ago, a big earthquake hit and, and many people were killed and it created a great tragedy. And a news organization created this, this, this uh, interactive documentary called Inside the Haiti Earthquake. And it was based on journalism, you know, that was done on site with cameras and video and interviewing. And they put this together so that you could experience it in three different ways. And you would enter into it either as an aid worker trying to help the survivors or as someone who was in the earthquake and is trying to survive or as a journalist and you're on assignment and you're doing a story and you have to go to you know talk to certain people ask them questions and uh record video and then put together a report so you have to make decisions and you know it immerses you and then there's another example this was a, a few years ago in uh london in one of the squares trafalgar square and there's a digital billboard uh, that had a camera embedded in it, running ahead of an, uh, a very sophisticated algorithm. And it was watching the people as they walked by. And the message on the billboard was about domestic violence. And it showed a woman with a battered eye, battered face. She had been a victim of domestic violence. And so the sign had a message that said, look at me. And each time someone would look at the sign, the, the camera would capture that and would heal her face just a little bit. And when enough people had looked at it, the bruising went away and the message changed and said, don't turn a blind eye to domestic violence. So it was allowing for an interactive experience without people having to do anything other than look at this digital billboard. So the second dimension, in addition to interactivity, these experiential media are immersive. So they, they envelop us. And usually this is, you know, most, you know, uh, immersive when it's done through a head worn display or some other kind of wearable device. And it gives us immersive enveloping audio, imagery, video, it's 360 degrees. It can be three dimensional. So, you know, they use stereoscopic cameras and, and imaging systems to create a sense of depth, but it's also psychologically immersive. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a wearable system. It could be immersive psychologically through, you know, using a handheld device or something that makes you feel like you're there or a part of the story. And it's, you know, this ubiquitous nature of the content that's increasing uh, this immersive nature. And a good example from journalism was launched by the New York Times on November 5th in 2015. At the time, the New York Times had about 1 million uh, subscribers and most of them were to the newspaper, the printed product. And at the time, the state of the art, which has is, is changed a lot in, in five years, but in 2015, the state of the art was you take your smartphone, you, you, take your, you take your phone and you put it inside the cardboard, which had a stereoscopic viewer and then you put it on your head and the, this phone would act as the computer, but you would see uh, 360 video. And it was immersive, but it was, you know, very low quality in that sense. But the cardboard was nice because the times could, they were very inexpensive. They cost, you know, about $5 uh, or maybe even less if you buy them in bulk. 
And what the Times did is they shipped free to all of their subscribers uh, a Google Cardboard. And then they produced this story, which they debuted on November 5th. It was called The Displaced. And it took you inside of three different refugee camps, um, including uh, in, in, in Jordan and, and elsewhere, where they, for one camp, they put a VR camera system on the handlebars of a, of a bicycle of a young boy who was living in the refugee camp. And as he rode around the, the camp, you were with him as if you were present, seeing what he's seeing from his point of view. And you could look in any direction and you'd get a sense of, you know, what life is like inside of a refugee camp while you're immersed uh, in that. And since then, the New York Times has produced, you know, uh, dozens and dozens of these kinds of immersive reports. One of the important lessons from this, though, is this idea of degrees of freedom, or DOF. So when the Times produced that displaced report, it was 360 degrees, and it gave you three degrees of freedom. So it was immersive. You could look in any direction, any you know, forward, backward, up, down, left, or right. But you couldn't move in those directions unless the, unless this camera took you there. So if you have those additional three degrees of freedom, the ability to move forward or backward or up or down or left or right, then you can have a system with six degrees of freedom and create a, a completely virtual reality. Otherwise, what you have is, you know, you have 360 degree video, but it's not a fully, uh, a full VR kind of experience. So, it's also important that these systems have high quality video as well as audio uh, so that it gives a, a sense of, of reality uh, for the user. Now I have a short uh, example here to illustrate. This is from uh, a couple of years ago, a journalist for CBS News named Jeff Lohr is visiting in a laboratory at Stanford University. This is a virtual reality laboratory. Uh, on the on the uh, left with his hands extended is a, the professor uh, Jeremy Balenson, who is uh, he's a leading researcher in virtual reality for uh, uh, Stanford University, and he has his laboratory where he's created an experience where Jeff Glor has the headset on the Oculus, and as he's walking through this room, to him the room looks like a bottomless pit with a narrow plank. And he's trying to walk across this plank. And it seems so real that for Mr. Glor, it's a, like a very almost terrifying experience because it feels like if he takes one false step, he could fall into the, into the pit. And what Professor Balenson is doing is, is studying people's reactions to these virtual experiences and using it as a, 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 a training platform to help people overcome their fear of heights. But that's one example. Let me just see if I can, if I can play a, just a brief segment of that. <laughs> All right, very good, very good. So what you just did, a lot of adults won't do that if they're trying to teach someone to overcome their fears. So that's the second dimension, the immersion. Now the third dimension is that they're multi-sensory. So experiential media not only give us sight and sound, but they can give us a haptic experience, one that's tactile. So this is this picture shows a woman who's immersed, has the sound, the sight, and also the haptic experience which makes it just another layer of you know, uh, realism. And using that combination, you can create experiences that are almost like you're really there. So a lot of virtual experiences have been developed for extreme sports like rock climbing, because you not only see and hear as if you're on that rock face, but you can feel the wall and you can feel the rock. And then the fourth dimension, the experiences are data and algorithm generated. And so where this started is with using natural language processing to be able to read and write. Uh, and there's a couple of developments of this from a university at Northwestern University, one called Narrative Science, where they already have a variety of news media who are using this system to, to actually report and write stories, uh, usually uh, 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 you know, in areas where the journalists wouldn't have the resources to do. So uh, one example was from a very local sports story where the system was able to put together a report about a local baseball game. 
back when they could still do sports, but uh, <laughs> maybe one day again, we'll be able to do that again. Uh, and then there's another one out of North Carolina. Uh, it's called Wordsmith from a company called Automated Insights. And the big news organization called the Associated Press has started using their system to do business reporting. So the system can read financial data and then write stories based on the financial data. And now they're extending this to other uh, areas of uh, journalism. And then also these kind of platforms, very advanced algorithms are used with experiential media increasingly for processing the, the 360 and 3D uh, video. So many of these systems, like the, the, uh, the one that I showed you from the Times, used a, a rig of, of 17 cameras uh, and they all are ultra high definition video. And if a human had to try to you know, stitch all of that together, it would take months or maybe even years. But the computer can do it in virtually real time using very advanced algorithms. So that's increasingly how the editing of the video is happening, you know, sort of human and computer working together. And I mentioned the, the first person nature. This is the fifth dimension of experiential media. And what I've, I've illustrated here is an example of, of a platform from Microsoft that's called the HoloLens. It uses holography uh, and it creates a three, 360 and three dimensional experience. So there's depth uh, to the experience as well as interactivity. And for the user, the user sees and participates as if they're present in this virtual environment. Only this system is using what's what you instead of calling VR would call mixed reality. Mixed reality is sort of the blending of augmented reality with virtual reality. So you see your room as it is, but also inside of the space are virtual objects. In this case, he's playing a game in his home, in his living room. So this is sort of like if you're in a home confinement and you wanna have some fun, you put on this system and now you can play a game and as if you're still in your living room, but now in this game, aliens, alien robots have invaded your living room. And I, I think I have a, a brief clip I can show. So that's the fifth dimension. Now the sixth dimension is what we might call the natural user interface. So this is where we no longer have to be typing or using, you know, uh, computerized uh, interfaces. Instead, we can simply use our, our human senses and natural way of communicating to engage with a digital experience. Uh, our voice, we can speak or we can look at something or we can just touch uh, something uh, maybe with a haptic interface or, or not. Uh, and a good example are these digital audio assistants. I don't know how popular these are in Turkey, but they're very popular. Uh, in the United States, more than 50 million Americans now have uh, smart speakers in their home, and you know more than 100 million are using some sort of a smart device that, like their smartphone, and they you know they use Siri or something like that and just talk to it. Uh, these systems have uh, very high quality audio. It's 360, uh, both uh, the microphones and the speakers. Uh, I don't want to say the uh, the name. Because if I say the Echo's name, then it's going to hear me because I have three of them in my home. And then it's going to want to answer me and start talking to me. And I, I don't want to get the, the thing you know, uh, interacting with me at the moment. So I'm going to avoid saying the name. But uh, uh, it's got you know, high quality audio and uh, both the speakers and the microphones. And it's on the cloud. So it's got a tremendous capability uh, to engage media content. You can tell it to play some music. Uh, you can have it tell you the news. You can have it tell you a joke. You can have it, you can connect your house so you can turn your lights on and off and control your thermostat and do different things, your security system, all this through your uh, digital device. Uh, and then you can play interactive games. There's one about a police uh, case, a detective case in Los Angeles called Bosch. And, and then, you know, when you've had enough, you say, Alexa, stop. But, you know, uh, that uh, uh, allows you to move on, but it's sometimes it can be very engaging because now they have a social chat bot where you can talk to the to your device for up to 20 minutes and just a conversation about anything. And I've done this with my daughter when the and the smart speaker, and it, it had tremendous knowledge. 
Uh, so you can really have a very enlightening conversation. So all of this is coming together to transform the way we tell stories in media, especially in journalism. So this, let me just touch on or highlight the traditional model of how we tell stories in journalism in the old analog world of media, sort of pre, you know, where we are today. The stories were linear. So there was a beginning, a middle and end. The user was like an audience member, but passive. They just, you know, watch the story or listen to the story. And the stories are in one or two modalities. So sight or sound, or maybe sight and sound combined like in television. The stories were fixed, so they're static. They're based on an event. So something happens and we tell that story. Uh, and the narrative is third person. So I, I tell a story. I say, yesterday, President Trump announced a new whatever. Uh, or I show you, maybe I show you President Trump, he's on the podium and I show you him speaking. In the experiential media model, all of those dimensions are changing. So we're moving toward a more non-linear story. So it's not one that necessarily starts here and ends there. It, you might dive right into the middle and then you might go in different directions. It's more interactive. So the user becomes a participant in the story like an eyewitness. Increasingly multi-sensory. So not just sight and sound, but also haptics, you know, the, the tactile dimension. The stories are increasingly dynamic. So they, you know, they keep, evolving and changing and they're and they're you know uh contextualized so and especially using data so we can make these stories very rich based on data and increasingly the stories give the the user a first person perspective so it's as if they're in the story seeing it from the point of view of of that person and it can be 360 it can be 3d it immerses you and and gives you that that virtual experience as if maybe you're, you're in that refugee camp. So what are the, uh, the, the platforms and some of the content? Well, the platforms are pretty diverse and they include for both augmented reality, there's, you know, there's handheld uh, platforms, there's wearable systems that you put on or even some you know, uh, things that are more like glasses. Uh, there's uh, things like a smartwatch, the Ivy Apple watch that has some you know, immersive uh, kinds of features. So it's really, you know, evolving uh, in, in many directions and coming from many places around the world, you know, whether it's in the US or in Asia or in Europe. And the content is similarly developing, you know, in, uh, you know, very interesting uh, ways. It's multi-sensory digital content that's layered onto either our reality or our virtual uh, reality. And it's been developed for a variety of arenas, in the arts, in games, in education and training. There's a lot of immersive cinema. I'm working on a new project looking at uh, some immersive cinema because there's really amazing content now that's available in that arena. Uh, in journalism, you know, a lot of immersive news, whether it's an augmented reality or virtual reality or just 360. Uh, there's a lot of social media, uh, people sharing their virtual worlds with others. Uh, VR being used for therapy uh, and a lot for tourism, you know, especially now with home confinement, people are going on virtual journeys to remote places that they can't otherwise, you know, go to. Now, you know, a lot of this seems like, wow, this is amazing. It's so new, but it's really not. It's been in development for more than a century. Uh, in fact, it was as early as 1901 that a science fiction writer named Frank Baum imagined an electronic character marker. So the, the person would put on a pair of goggles and if they looked at the other person, it would show their character. You know, are they a trustworthy person? You know, are they a bad person? It would show their character. And, you know, you may not recognize the name Frank Baum, but he's very famous. His name isn't, but his work is, at least here in the US, he wrote something very famous called The Wizard of Oz, which was, you know, a very popular book, but even more popular movie. Uh, and so uh, half a century later, 1940, and, and that character marker was really the first imagining of augmented reality, you know, layering something onto the real world. Then a half century later, another science fiction writer, Ray Bradbury, envisioned an electronic nursery. And in this 1949 short story called The Velt, it was a VR environment where the children just had to think and we actually have now brain computer interfaces where if you think you can control the computer or control the environment. So his imagining in 1949 is becoming true today. Uh, by 1957, 
uh, Martin Hellig developed this thing called a sensorama. It was all analog, but it was all electronic. And it immersed up to four people simultaneously into an, a virtual environment that had visual and sound and, and wind and haptics and smell. It had all of our human senses engaged. Uh, 10 years later, Ivan Sutherland developed the first head-worn display. So it was the first you know, real VR kind of system, although we didn't have that term yet. It was not till 1987 that General Lanier coined the phrase virtual reality and designed the first commercial VR headset. So Mr. Sutherland's was a research prototype, but by 1987, General Lanier had created the first commercial VR headset. A couple of years after that, Steve Mann developed the first wearable computer and did a lot of work with that system. And then in 1990, Tom Caudell coined the term augmented reality. He was working for an aircraft company and he saw this as important to the field of air, you know, airplane uh, production. So all of these things were available in the 1990s. And so in 1997, I worked with a computer science colleague of mine at Columbia University named Sri Nayar. And he had developed a 360 camera that we imagine we could take out of the laboratory. It had never been out of the lab, but my students took this out of the lab, put it on a, uh, a, a monopod, uh, not a tripod, but a monopod. It just had one, one leg and you had to hold it. But they did a report about a parade in New York City called the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And there was a group called the Irish Lesbian Gay Organization that wanted to march in the parade but the parade organizers were very conservative and they said, no, we don't want anyone gay in our parade. So the, the, or the I'll go to said, we're gonna march anyway. And my students learned of this, they did this 360 report and they marched along with them capturing the 360 video and the police came and arrested the, the, the I'll go members. And so it was a very you know, powerful report and my students won an award for, uh, inter, you know, for innovation in this form of 360 documentary. And then shortly after that, working with two other colleagues of mine in computer science at Columbia University, uh, Tobias Hellerer and uh, Professor Stephen Feiner, we developed this thing we call the, immerse, the situated documentary. It's situated in a place. Um, and we used augmented reality so that you put on the head-worn display. And what you're looking at here in the, in the screen, this is an AR view of the actual Columbia University campus on the Morningside Heights campus. And there's actual objects like, like this building is real, but these flags, those are virtual objects. And the way the system works is if you looked at one of those flags for a half a second, it would select it. And then an immersive experience would start to happen, telling you about, say, it would take you back in time to 1968 when the students were protesting university plans to build a gymnasium, or even before that, when uh, Enrico Fermi, you may recognize that name, he was one of the developers of the Manhattan Project that led to the atom bomb, the new hydrogen bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima in, in the end of World War II. Well, he first did his, a lot of his pioneering work at Columbia University, and he was building a nuclear pile in the basement of one of the Columbia buildings. And he recruited the students from the football team to haul the uranium through a tunnel that goes under the campus. And you're not allowed to go there now, but my students got someone to take them inside and they shot 360 video inside the tunnel. And so you could virtually uh, go in there. And then more recently, 2013, with a, one of my doctoral students at Rutgers, Frank Bridges, Frank and I did an AR project where we took, uh, that we saw a story that was in the New York Times about some art at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And they had on loan from the Nanjing Museum in China this beautiful hand-painted uh, hand scroll. Uh, and I thought, you know, this is really a, a beautiful image and the story was very interesting, but I thought, you know, it's, it's not really uh, very immersive. What could we do differently? And we got in touch with the, the museum, uh, the Met and the museum in Nanjing, and they both uh, allowed us to do this project where we embedded augmented reality into this image. And so if you, you know, you have your smartphone and you're running an app, an AR app, and you point it at this image, and it'll recognize the image as that hand scroll, and then it will layer onto it a video with sight and sound of the curator from the Met explaining what this hand scroll is and how there's a ritual 
how you're supposed to open it because it unfurls and you're, and you're supposed to do it in a very particular way and what it means and, and all that. So we thought that's a, that's a way that journalists could use AR to take a story and add you know, more context to it. And since then, a lot of you know, media now in the past decade, since 2010, are starting to use you know, 360 video and AR. I mentioned the Times example, but there are many others. Uh, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Philadelphia Inquirer, the, the Guardian, that's the UK, uh, Associated Press, CBS News, Vice News, and then many others around the world have been using AR and VR or at least 360 video in doing journalism. Uh, Vice News, they live streamed using, this was back when Google Glass was you know, kind of more widely available. This reporter, Tim Poole, went to these various sites and he reported during the protest. He did one from Ferguson, New Jersey, and I believe he actually even did one from Istanbul. There were protests and he went on site and he would walk with the protesters and he was live streaming in 360 and you could interact with him. Uh, and then more recently, two years ago or three years ago now, I guess, uh, there was a solar eclipse that was going to happen and the news media were doing a lot of reporting about this and CBS News created an AR that was embedded into their newsroom. So it wasn't interactive for the user, but it was immersive. And I have a short clip I can show, it's just a few seconds, but it'll show you the kind of AR animation they created. Everybody, you know, this is gonna be a heck of an event for us. And to give you a better idea of what exactly it is, what you can expect for you, we have set up this cool little solar system right here in Studio 57. Now we all know that the Earth so it's an AR animation that's it's not really in the newsroom there, but it looks like it is. So the New York Times worked on this, you know, starting with their 2015 report, all of 2016. And then in 2017, they, they, they kind of summarized the lessons. And what they had done is they produced 360 video in 57 different countries. So they'd done dozens of these kinds of reports. They involved over 200 of their journalists. They had 94 million views on Facebook, 2 million views on YouTube, 4.5 billion views uh, in total. And so it's been growing and growing. And by August, they had increased the subscriptions to the New York Times. Remember in 2015, when they launched this project, they had 1 million subscribers, virtually all of them to the print product. By August of 2019, they had 4.7 million subscribers and 3.8 million of them were digital only. And by and now, you know, now we're in, you know, in, in April of 2020, they're up over five, uh, close to five million uh, subscribers, and over four million are digital only. Now, some people say that, you know, it's for other, it's not just the 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 you know the immersive content. It's also because of the political environment, but it's it's a lot of it's due to the use of these new storytelling forms because that's why people want when they go on their digital device, they want something that's uniquely designed for that. Uh, they've continued to innovate. And in 2018, remember the Seoul Olympics? Well, the New York Times created a new AR experience because Apple introduced a new kind of AR where you could anchor it in the room with the user. And they created an, an interactive AR story with one of the US Olympians, a uh, figure skater named Nathan Chen. And they introduced it. This is an image of how it would look to the user. And this is what they would access. First, they would see this the image on the left and it would say tap to place. So you would touch your phone if you wanted the image to be placed in that spot. Then Nathan Chen would appear in front of you and he's in 3D. So if you move closer, like I am, he, gets, he would get bigger and bigger, but you could, he's three dimensional. So you could walk around him and you could see him from the back or the side, top or bottom. And one of the things that this allowed you to do is experience what it's like when he's, when he, you know, figure skaters often will, will spin. And on that axis of rotation, they go incredibly fast. And, and it's one thing for me to tell you, it's another thing to see and experience him spinning 400 revolutions per minute. So it gives you another way to experience the story. And then you may remember this, this was later that year, there was a, a boys football team, or in the, U, in the US we call it soccer, everybody else calls it football. And this football team was trapped after a game. They went into this cave. They were from Thailand. They were exploring and it rained and water came in and they were trapped 
in this cave and it became an international story uh, about, you know, would they be rescued? Would it be possible to rescue them? And the Times created an AR experience where using your, your phone, you could virtually go into that cave, but bring it right into your space. And you could see the size of some of the openings that the boys had to crawl through. So it gave you a whole different sense of, you know, through a virtual experience, what it would have been like. And then you can take this in new directions. And so there's another platform, it's called the HTC Vive. It was created in, in uh, 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 Taiwan. And you can go on virtual flight and get different views. And so drones are being used now to create virtual flight, including for journalism. Uh, and as I've suggested, a lot of this is global. So this HTC, they're based in, in Taiwan, but in mainland China, there are companies experimenting with this as well. Huawei, Xiaomi are investing in this. And there's a lot of technology for AR as well as now untethered, like the, the Oculus Quest is, the, is one that's untethered and really very compelling. Uh, there are a lot of news media uh, and social media, Baidu and Tencent and Alibaba, which sort of the Amazon of, of China, they own the South China Morning Post and starting to experiment with some of these things. In South Korea, Samsung, they create one of the, you know, they've been heavily involved with production of VR. Uh, and so the Oculus Go was the first uh, of the uh, untethered that was developed for Oculus. Now the Quest is, uh, you know, much, uh, much better uh, in terms of the platform. So how am I doing on time? Time's okay? Yeah, you're fine. Uh, we right. will also answer the questions after this. Right. Well, now we'll move now to offer some conclusions, some questions and some, some thoughts about possible effects. You know, what does research tell us? Because there's a lot of research that's happening now and then I, then I take questions. So one of the big questions is, can these immersive experiences like VR and AR create for the user a sense of presence as if they're really in that place? Can these experiential media transform the public from the traditional role in the media of passive, you know, you're just you know, sitting and watching to that of active participant? Uh, and as a result, can they increase the engagement of the user and create more empathy. So, you know, kind of a sense of understanding someone else's uh, situation. And can they influence your ability to remember, you know, recall memory, and even your intention to act? You know, you meant, the director, I think, mentioned his doctoral dissertation. When I, when I did mine back in 1983, it was about effects of media on intentions to act in improving your, your, the, the healthiness of your, of your behavior. The research on all of these so far is, is telling us the answer is yes. There's research at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University. There's research at the Media Effects Lab at Pennsylvania State University. And there's my own research I've been doing with colleagues in the Middle East, in Qatar and the Emirates about AR and VR, that these things can increase a sense of presence, that they do increasingly enable the user to be active, that they do increase engagement and empathy, and that they even may shape our memory and our intentions to act. So as we look to the future, though, we should raise some more cautionary concerns, because these things are becoming increasingly uh, virtually real. They seem real. And as we move toward volumetric displays, it may seem to the user that there's no more of media, that this is just happening around me because the images are three-dimensional and photorealistic and, and I can interact with them like I do with a smart speaker today. The content may become virtually indistinguishable and we may forget. Was, I know I just saw a report about this. There was a st study a woman couldn't remember. Was that real or was that a virtual experience? And then there's what's called neural reality. You may know a, a gentleman named Elon Musk. Elon Musk, he's the head of the Tesla company. You know, they're famous for their car and for other things. And he has a company that has a prototype now and they, they're hoping to introduce this commercially called Neuralink. And Neuralink using neural reality. It's a direct brain computer interface between a computer and the human brain and allows the human to control the computer simply with thought. And right now they're being used for people with disabilities, paraplegics, but they're also developing this as a game platform. 
increasingly these experiential media are becoming unobtrusive. You know, we just talk or look or, or, or touch ubiquitous and persistent. So they're with us all the time. But they raise a lot of important ethical questions and policy concerns. So there are implications for privacy or for your security or even for health. People might become addicted to some of these platforms or there's opportunities for misinformation uh, and possibly other crime. But at the same time, there's tremendous economic opportunity. You know, I've been looking at for you know, the coronavirus has had such an impact on traditional areas of the economy. But for online, things are booming, you know, like Zoom. And, and so there's, you know, it's a it's a double-edged sword. So finally, maybe there's a clash of what's right and what's wrong. I've shown a picture there of a famous journalist uh, who was a champion of freedom of speech and press, what we call the First Amendment, but it's you know the general idea of freedom of speech and press. But we have to balance that with the public's right to privacy. And this journalist that I've shown there, his name was Edward R. Murrell. And when television was new, like the internet and virtual reality are today, he said that, he said this to news directors, uh, TV can teach, it can illuminate. Yes, it's e it can even inspire, but it's up to us humans to determine whether TV would be more than just wires and lights in a box. And today we might say something similar about experiential media. They might bring us closer to truth or they may transform fake news into artificial reality. So that, that's it, thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Your audio thank is on. Thank you awesome. very much. Uh, it was a wonderful speech. Uh, we would like to also thank to our rector, vice rectors and deans to give us this, uh, to, to give us a chance to make this presentation. There are many questions actually. I would like to start. Uh, the first one is, what do you think of the new journalism ethics? Today, journalists must determine new ethics codes. Must uh, So are there different discussions about uh, virtual reality journalism? Absolutely. That's an excellent question. Uh, and it's one that uh, one of my doctoral students has actually done a research project about uh, some aspects of the ethics in virtual reality, because there are a lot of problems that, you know, there maybe there's some traditional elements, but there's also some new uh, problems that, that can emerge, especially as these can become so seemingly real. So I think we need to have a well-developed uh, framework for, for journalism ethics in AR and VR, especially so that, you know, there's going to be so much image manipulation. I think we need to make sure that the public is never deceived. We want to make sure that we have strong ethical guidelines so that if we create a synthetic environment, maybe you recreate a story or we create a simulation that we make sure that it's clear to the user that this is simulated, that this is not the reality. So I think you know, we need to take great care when it comes to the possibility of deceiving people or having you know, effects. Like some of the game platforms now, they, they, the first thing they make you do is create a safe space where you can't physically get hurt. Uh, so I think we need to do the same thing for journalism, create a, a safe space where we know that, that you get the content, you know what you can trust. Okay, thank you. And there are many questions actually. Uh, are there ER or VR examples in advertising? Oh, absolutely. Uh, sort of the broader domain of marketing uh, is, is, is a big area for this, but advertising too, where there's, there's one example I use for my students is from, uh, there's a famous uh, game here in the US that we call football. <laughs> and every year in February, they play the championship, which they call the Super Bowl. Uh, and as recently as last year, there were advertisements where if you took your device out, your smartphone or your tablet and, and pointed it at the commercial, there was augmented reality embedded into the commercial and it was interactive. So not only could you get additional content, but you could engage with it. Uh, you might be able to make a purchase. And then there are other companies that are combining their marketing with their advertising on their device for example, they allow you to try on products like sunglasses, and then you can see them on your head, and then you can change the color. You can change the style of the, of the frames. 
So there's a lot happening with trying on virtual clothing. And then companies like IKEA are developing this so that you can you know, try out their product in your actual living room and see what this couch would look like here or move it over there. Okay, thank you. Uh, in your media experiences, is reality itself or reality effect more important? Is there a domination of the reality effect on uh, reality? Well, you know, I think that that's a great question, but I think the line between what's real and what's virtually real is, is blurring. I mean, think about how much time we spend with our screens now. Uh, I, something like average of eight hours a day that people in the US now spend with their screens. And so it's, I mean, it's, it's not real in a sense, but it is real in the sense that you're really doing it, you know? So I think that they're both important. Uh, I, I think that we have to be very careful that people don't wind up getting completely addicted uh, to these uh, virtual experiences. Uh, but a lot of them are very physical. You know, you can be very active. So there's a lot now happening so that people who are in home confinement are using virtual sports interfaces to work out. It's a real workout, but you're in a virtual space. So you might not be in your living room anymore. Now you might be in some mountain. You might be running through some remote location, but you're still running. So I think the line between what's real and what's virtual is, is blurring and the effects go both directions. You know, I think the virtual can impact us, but I think the, the, what's in the physical world can also impact uh, on the virtual. Okay, another question related to this. Uh, it says, uh, he says, how can we believe news in virtual realistic world? Everything is possible. Well, that's where I think that we need to have very high standards of ethics so that we commit to never misleading the public and that we make the truthfulness of what we're reporting be our top priority and that when anything we create that's virtual or augmented reality has to be clearly labeled so the public knows that this is a that this is a synthetic representation meant to give you a, a virtual experience with the object or with the event or at the event but that it's been, you know, it's created experience. And I think people will, you know, will, uh, that'll be a, an effective approach by labeling things clearly. Okay, uh, what can you say about the difference between interactive media experiences and the experience of real reality? Another question, they're related actually to each other. Yeah, okay, well, here's one that kind of answers several of these questions all together. And it was before we had like really advanced systems for virtual reality, but you know, it all existed and it was, but it was most experimental. But back in, in the year 1999, if you remember when we were transitioning to 2000, people were afraid that our, our computer systems might crash because of the year, the millennium bug, you know? And, and I remember it was in Times Square, one of the news organizations, it was NBC News was broadcasting live from Times Square and I actually had some student interns there. And some colleagues of mine were watching their newscast and it was showing Times Square, you know, that famous square in New York City with all the bright lights and everything. And it looked wonderful, but he noticed that, that something was missing because he had used to work for CBS News and CBS News had a digital billboard there. And it was not in the square and he thought, I wonder, did CBS get rid of their billboard just since yesterday? And later on, he followed up and it found out that NBC had, uh, or maybe it was CBS, one of them had removed the other sign. And so <laughs> I think it was CBS that removed NBC's sign. And one of them had removed the other sign. And so what they saw of Times Square no longer had their competitor's advertisement in that setting. So. They admitted they did that, it was a mistake, and they vowed to never do that again. So I think that's a very important example of how the two, the virtual and the real can impact each other. Okay. What about the technological needs and limits for wider audiences and connected question? Will there be any new ethics for media? How would the critical thinking and critical media literacy be changed if you have no limits to create such reality? Well, I think that one thing that will change is we'll need to keep continually advancing our understanding of media. You know, it, it won't be a, a, you know, a, a fixed target, in other words. We'll have to keep 
learning more and can be, and continue to have a critical eye. And I would say for the for the uh, uh, user, it will mean always looking at things with some skepticism. Not to be, I don't, I'm not saying being cynical, but being skeptical. So you should always question something. So before you share it, check it out and and go and look at another site. See if in fact this seems to be maybe it's not real. Um, and then for the youth, for the media, I think it's very important that they maintain close communication with the public. I think we need to start a better conversation with the public to make sure that if we did something in, in journalism that the public didn't understand, that we try to respond to that and, and to make, and you know, traditionally when news media do corrections, it's because they find out there was an error and usually the source is, oh, you spelled my name wrong. But I think journalism might want to start thinking about doing updates and follow-ups based on just simply when maybe what they reported left a misperception in the public's eye and to then try to do you know stories that will uh, clarify something that had been previously reported. The last two questions. Is there any standard for security and privacy policy for ER and VR technology or the data security side? And also in another question connected, maybe you can answer both of them. Does COVID-19 speed up the transition to augmented reality or where will it go? Uh, well, both of those are great questions. I, I don't, I'm not sure whether the, you know, the crisis will speed up the transition, but I did see a study that shows that people are spending a lot more time using things like VR and AR, but that the companies can't manufacture the platforms fast enough to meet demand because there's so much demand for it. So I think that maybe once we get through the crisis and we can start producing more of these platforms, I think that we will see tremendous growth. And then in terms of you know, security, what standards, I think that it needs to be a high priority. And I think that we'll need to have some use of encryption to make sure that when journalists create content or users are participating, that that's somehow not, you know, uh, being uh, hacked or stolen or their privacy being invaded. Uh, so that we can make sure that the experience is is one we can trust and that is safe. Okay. Yeah, all the questions, other questions are similar to each other. Thank you very much for joining our conference. Uh, we appreciate all your efforts. It's a pleasure for us to meet with you in this platform. And we would like to keep in touch with you soon. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Have a great, uh, rest of bye your day. Bye. Bye Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pavlik. My pleasure. Okay, have a nice day. You too. Thank you. It, it was a really great honor for us to host you here with us. Uh, thank you very much. We learned a lot, a lot of things, a lot of uh, new ideas, new opinions, and improvements uh, about the, this field. Thank you very much. Thank we you. We would like to host you again at our university physically. <laughs> All right. Virtually. Thank you. We would like to also thank to our rector, vice rectors, and deans to give us a chance to, to make this conference. Thank you very much for listening. Also. Bye bye. Thank you.